1 Kings 15, beginning in verse 9. This is the word of our Lord describing King Asa and his reign. It begins this in verse 9. So in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa began to reign as king of Judah. He reigned 41 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Makah, the daughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was right in the sight of Yahweh, like David his father. He also put away the male cult prostitutes from the land and removed all the idols with which his father is made. He also removed Makah, his mother, from being queen mother because she'd made a horrid image as an Asherah. And Asa cut down her horrid image and burned it in the brook of Kidron. But the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly devoted to Yahweh, his God, all his days. He brought into the house of Yahweh the dedicated things of his father and his own dedicated things, silver and golden utensils. Now there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. If you remember that Israel and Judah had split, they're two different nations now. David's line is in Judah, Israel's the other 10 tribes attacking them. There's war between them all of their days. Verse 17, Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and fortified Ramah. Ramah is about four miles away from Jerusalem. So this is right on their doorstep. Went up against Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from going out or coming into Asa, king of Judah. So then Asa took all the silver and gold which were left in the treasuries of the house of Yahweh and the treasuries of the king's house and delivered them into the hands of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tibramon, the son of Hezion, the king of Aram, who lived in Damascus, saying, let there be a treaty between you and me as between my father and your father. Behold, I've sent you a present of silver and gold. So go break your vow, your vow with your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. Now you need a little strategy here in your mind. Israel surrounds Judah. Judah is landlocked. They can't get to the Mediterranean Sea because that's where Ramah is and Israel has blocked it. So they send messengers down out towards the Jordan River, over the Jordan River, into modern day Syria to Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, and they're going to pay him to go attack Israel. So they're paying a different, they're paying country C to attack country B. If you're familiar with the risk, this is a tale as old as time right here, the, the board game risk. We've seen this move before. Well, he pays him. Verse 20, so Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel and conquered Ejon and Dan and Abel, beth Makah and all of Chinneroth besides all the land of Naphtali. When Basha heard of it, he ceased fortifying Ramah and remained in Tizra. So King Asa made a proclamation to all Judah. No one was exempt and they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber with which Basha had built. King Asa built with them Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. Now the rest of all the acts of Asa and all his might and all that he did and all the cities which he built, aren't they written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? But in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. And Asa slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. Now more about that foot disease. Second Chronicles 16, verse 7. At that time, Hanani, the seer, the prophet, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you relied on the king of Syria and you did not rely on Yahweh, your God, the army of Syria has escaped you. Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? But because you relied on Yahweh, he gave them into your hands. For the eyes of Yahweh run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. You've done foolishly in this. So from now on, you will have wars. And Asa was angry with the seer and put him in the stocks in prison for he is in a rage with him because of this. And Asa inflicted cruelties upon some of the people at the same time. And the acts of Asa from the first to the last are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet. His disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek Yahweh, but sought help from the physicians. You can be seated. We live today in a generation, I think, of lower standards, lower expectations. Gone are the days of great expectations. They've been replaced with no expectations. Allow me for a moment to give you the kids these days speech. I had someone recently tell me that I was the the age of their grandfather, and so I'm 
I feel totally equipped to give you this speech right now. There has been a long history of people in the church history, in the Christian faith, who have done great things for the cause of Christ when they were teenagers. Think of Spurgeon preaching his first sermon at age 15, or Jonathan Edwards, who graduated from Yale as the valedictorian at age 17. And he gave his valedictorian address in Latin, as another side note, 17 years old, whippersnapper. <laughs> Lady Jane Grey, the nine-day Queen of England, English translations of the Bible had been banned by the king for, for so long that she had taught herself, as 12-year-old girl, she taught herself to read the New Testament in Greek so that she could read the word of God for herself. She died a martyr's death at age 17. Kids throughout most of church history have married younger, worked younger, finished school younger, learned more than one language, etc. You know, our children today are superstars if they play more than one sport. <laughs> Many of our kids go to college, don't get jobs, move back home, don't take steps forward in marriage or in the workplace, just have the, the phrase now that psychologists use is extended adolescence, straight on up through the 20s. Video games become normal. Basement dwelling becomes typical. Lowered expectations, constant coddling, combined to teach young people that there are no expectations except to generally stay out of trouble. In fact, the only expectations today get turned negative. You hear people say, or parents say, I have, my son is a good boy or my daughter is a good girl because they, and what follows is a list of things they don't do. I'm so proud of my son. He is not in jail. He's a good kid because he hasn't got fired from his job yet. He's a good, he's a good boy because you know, he's not homeless. Some of you parents might quibble with that statement too. <laughs> that becomes the era of low expectations. It gets measured negatives, not positives. It seems like gone are the days of actually achieving something or accomplishing something to make a name for yourself. There's blogs written by Ivy League professors about this as they lament their cause, anonymously, of course, where they complain that even in the Ivy Leagues, admission standards have gone out the floor or the colleges are more or less paying students to come. Gone are the days of grades actually reflecting merit. Now grades reflect showing up. There's a blog post written by one Harvard professor about how when he started teaching, he would tell his class, if you meet the requirements of this class, you get a C. If you meet them well, you get a B. And if one or two of you are exceptional, I might give you an A. He said, if you were to try that this, this year, you wouldn't make it through the semester. You'd be called to the dean's office. The professor would get in trouble. What do you mean only one or two students get an A? If they meet the bare requirements of the class, they all A's are the starting point. In fact, there's a comment under his blog post from a professor who did do just that, who announced to his class that he was going to give one or two A's for the most exceptional students in the whole class. That was it. He didn't make it halfway through the semester before he was removed from class. That's our world today. You know, I'm not concerned about the Ivy League grading standards, or I'm not concerned about, you know, what happens to 20-somethings. I'm concerned about the decline of expectations in the church. That same atrophy, atrophy, the same apathy, the same decline, you see it affecting a religious affections. I mean, it used to be that the sign of somebody who was doing something for Christ was an affection in their heart for the Lord. They were on fire for the Lord. Now we seem to treat young people if they're Christians as if they're attending church regularly. You, know, you hang out in the atrium one Sunday a month and oh, you're totally following the Lord. That seems to be the attitude. And that's not the way it should be. But it is the generation of Asa. Asa was born into a world of low expectations. He was born into a culture that didn't accomplish anything for, for Yahweh, a culture that didn't follow the Lord, that had a religion of convenience. If you remember the first half of 1 Kings 15, is all about how they styled their own religion to meet their own felt needs. They built high places close to their house so that no one had have to travel to go too far to the temple. Now, that might make sense in all of Israel, but in Judah, it makes zero sense. I mean, Judah is essentially built around the temple, and yet people would build their high places right on their front porch so they could just worship God there. And of course, they weren't really worshiping God. They were worshiping their own lust, their own desires, their own image of what God was like, not subject to any authority over them. Eventually, that gave way to idol worship. 
People worshiped when they want, how they want, who they want. And once you start worshiping when you want and how you want, what's to stop the who? Where do you draw the line? Well, the people in Asa's generation, they didn't draw the line anywhere. They worshiped however they wanted to worship. The prophets of Asa's generation, they were confused. They were corrupt. The last two prophets we've seen in the book of 1 Kings, they, I mean, one was lying. The other was killed by God. Those are the prophets of Asa's generation. We haven't seen a priest in generations, by the way. I mean, there, there's no worshiping the Lord going on in his world. Asa was born in the king's house with a temple right outside his window. Remember Solomon built his house right next to the temple. Asa could see the temple from his crib, but he'd have no idea what it meant because Asa's father changed the way a temple worship happened. It all became about the show, not the substance. It became about decoration, not actually depending upon Yahweh. It was pomp and circumstance, not the divine transcendence of God as the whole world began to worship their own needs rather than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Self-styled worship in a self-styled way, that was the world in which Asa made his entrance. There's good news in that for us because if Asa could shine in his world, so can we in ours. The good news is that the darker the night, the brighter the light. And these events that I just read earlier, they took place 910 to 869 BC, 2,927 years ago. But it seems like it could be today. The lower the world sets the bar, the more the man who exceeds them will stand out. Yet it seems that there are so few people that want to exceed them. There's most people, it seems, even in the church, delight in the low expectation, delight in the low bar, the lowest common denominator, the lowest shelf you can put things on. That's where the feasting really is, it seems. I was on a flight a few years ago from Atlanta and uh, Atlanta to DC. And I say a few years ago, just so you have the chronology here, it was well before the presidential election. I was somewhat apathetic towards politics as I think I remain to this very moment. And a man sat next to me in the, the middle seats on, on this flight. And uh, he looked vaguely familiar, but I couldn't quite place him. And then up comes a flight attendant who says, sir, we would like you to sit in first class. Most people in first class are wanting to give you their seat. <laughs> and he said, no, no, I'm fine here. And this got my attention. I mean, I've never heard that conversation before. <laughs> so I'm looking at him. My mind is going through the card catalog of images in my mind. And I think he looks like Congressman John Lewis. But he's a civil rights hero. You don't know who he is, but... I was pretty sure I knew who he was, pretty sure I I recognized him, but not 100%. And so you want to see an awkward conversation. (laughs) Picture me trying to ask an older African-American gentleman if he is perhaps a civil rights hero. (laughs) Turns out it was John Lewis. He had the scars on his head to prove it. And he was very kind to me. He made it as, he lessened the awkwardness and we chatted most of the flight. And he could tell that I didn't follow politics. I didn't know which party he was part of, for example. I knew there were probably some major issues that we, he and I would be on the different side of the aisle on. But in this case, we were on the same side of the aisle in a literal sense. <laughs> Found out that he went to seminary, that he often preaches. And so I asked him, do you have any advice for me? I didn't want to be one of those guys who like provoked a fight with somebody on the plane flight. I'm going to roll with it. Do you have any advice for me, Congressman Lewis? And he said, yeah, let me give you the advice that I tell all young people to ask me that question. And I'm holding on to the story right now because of the earlier story about me being a grandfather. It's <laughs> special to me right now. Congressman Lewis says, I have advice for you that I give all young people that ask me for advice. The problem today, he says, is there are so few people that want to be like Asa. There are so few people that are willing to cause problems for Christ. There's so few people, he said, uh, the world today prizes people and raises kids, raises kids who want to stay out of trouble. That we've lost the ability to raise people who want to get into trouble for the Lord. He says he calls it good trouble. And if you Google his name, it's kind of his trademark now, get in good trouble. It's true. We have a world of people that You know, teach their kids, keep your head down, stay in line, don't make waves. That's the key to success. 
That might be the key to success in some worlds, but this isn't one of them. Gone, it seems, are the days where somebody would want to change the world for Christ. And you can't change the world unless you go against it. There is a good trouble that's worth getting into. And that's why Asa is such an example in Scripture. I want to give you an outline this morning. I want to describe to you what the name Asa means. What Asa means. Asa literally means healer, but it, so much more is wrapped into this as well. Listen, you've never met a Manasseh in your life, have you? <laughs> you've never met an Abinajam or an Ahaz or a Rehoboam or an Abijah. I doubt it. But you have met a David. You have met a Josiah. And you have met an Asa. This is why. First, Asa means setting your heart after Yahweh. Setting your heart after Yahweh. It says, as we meet Asa, that he did right according to the Lord, that he had his heart reserved for Yahweh. Look at chapter 15, verse 14. Chapter 15, verse 14. It says, Asa had his heart wholly devoted to Yahweh all of his days. His entire heart wholly devoted to Yahweh for all of his life. This is what it means to be a man after God's own heart, of course. And when you look earlier in chapter 15, when you're introduced to Asa, it says he comes from the line of his father. He was like, verse 11 says, Asa did what was right in the sight of Yahweh, like David, his father. So he had his heart set aside to Yahweh, like David, his father. Now David was his great grandfather. Nevertheless, he's a direct descendant to him. Solomon's heart doesn't seem to be totally devoted to Yahweh. Rehoboam's heart wasn't devoted to Yahweh. Uh, uh, Abijam's heart was not devoted to Yahweh, but Asa's was. In that sense, he bypasses his previous generations and connects right to David because David, remember, was a man after God's own heart. God saw through the facade of David's older brothers. He saw his older brothers were all more muscular. They were strapping, but God saw through their seven-minute workout abs and saw right to David's heart. He wasn't fooled by appearance. He even told Samuel, I don't look at the outside of a man. I look at his heart. And that's why scripture says Asa was a man after God's own heart, like David was. Asa's heart was totally devoted to the Lord all his days of his life. This, of course, Jesus says is the greatest command. Matthew 22, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. This is the greatest command, Jesus says. It's the first and the greatest. It's the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. Asa represents a person who is set aside from the world because their heart has been set aside. There's lots of people that follow the Lord with their feet, but not with their hearts. With their hands, but not with their hearts. God doesn't care about the feet or the hands. He cares about the heart. You know, Jesus himself condemned the Jewish nation of his day because he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. There's lots of people that will say things about the Lord, but they reserve their heart for themselves. But remember what I said earlier, the true measure of success, the true measure of devotion, the true measure of achievement or accomplishment is having a heart that is filled with affections for Christ. A heart that loves the Lord. That's why Asa stands out. He's a remarkable figure. Chapter 15 is essentially devoted to him. There's three chapters in 2 Chronicles devoted to him. What makes him so different than the world is that his heart was separated from the world for the Lord. How does that happen? Well, it's a work of the Spirit, of course. Romans 5, 5, you have the love of, broad, uh, love of God shed abroad in your heart. It's God's Spirit who does this to you. Asa had his heart separated from the world for the cause of the Lord. Asa means setting your heart after Yahweh. Secondly, Asa means standing against the gods of this world. Standing against the gods of this world. Asa took on the world. Asa became king, by the way, when he was 18 years old. He was a boy. He was single. He wasn't married yet. Yet he opposed the world. We learn in 2 Chronicles 15 that he had such courage. He was able to do so much because he drew from God's word. This courage isn't grown on a tree. This courage that Asa demonstrates comes from the word of the Lord. The prophets came to him and ministered to him. He took their word. And by taking the word from the prophet, he took courage from them so he could go on and attack the idols of his day. 
He took counsel on how to stand for Yahweh. Second Chronicles describes that when he got his advisors together, he would ask them what to do for the cause of the Lord. That's what it means to take on this world. And if you see, once he became king, the first description we get in verse 12 is he put away the cult prostitutes of the land. Remember, the people in Judah had built these high places so they could worship as they saw fit there. The next thing it is they built these sexually explicit images on those high places and they populated them with, with prostitutes. And you could worship the Lord in that way, they said. Asa took care of that business. He removed the male cult prostitutes. The review of the King James Version it says he removed the sodomites from the land. He removed all the idols his father had made. His father had filled Judah with these idols. Asa got rid of them. He took on sin. He removed it, replaced it. He removed it, identified it as sin, and then replaced it with something else. He didn't take half-hearted measures. He didn't get sidetracked on secondary issues. He went right for the heart issue that was besetting in Judah. Perhaps you've heard the saying, if you're going to hit it, hit it in the face. I think Asa had that tattooed on his chest. <laughs> Asa took on his world. He removed the idols. He went right after people's worship. He didn't go after what color they painted their fences. He didn't go after how many camels they had or where they parked them. He went right after what they worshiped. And he exposed it as sin and fixed it. He removed the, tempta- he removed the sin by removing the temptations to sin. He didn't just ban idol worship. He banned the actual idols, kicked them out. This is the New Testament model of sanctification, by the way. Remove, renew, replace. Something causing you to sin, you remove it, you confess it as sin, and you replace it with something else. Drunkenness, remove the drunkenness. Confess it as sin, replace it with being filled with the Spirit. Lust, remove the lust. Confess it as sin, replace it with meditating on Scripture. Pride, remove the pride, confess it as sin, replace it with humility. Stealing, remove the stealing, confess it as sin, replace it with giving things away. This is the model, remove, renew, replace. You battle it your whole life. This is what Asa did in a real sense, removing the idols and driving people back to the worship of Yahweh. He made no exceptions. Even in his own family, he took image, or he took issue with the images of the idols. He brought reform to Israel. There's chapters in 2 Chronicles that describe that, but this isn't that. Just know the scripture has much to say about the reform that Asa brought. Thirdly, Asa means standing against the sins of your own family. Asa means standing against the sins of your own family. This was the dividing line here for Asa. This is what separates the men from the boys, is the ability to deal with sin even within the households even within the household. Listen, there are no shortage of people who are able to identify what is wrong in the world. (laughs) There's no shortage of people able to identify the moral pitfalls that those outside of the church are committing. There's also no shortage of people able to identify the pitfalls and, and the moral trappings of those inside of the church. But there is a shortage of people with the convictions to even deal with their own households. So easy to condemn the world. So easy to condemn those outside of Christ. I know so many that speak so boldly about so much, but don't have control of their own house. That won't confront sin in their, their, their wives or their children or their parents. Oh man, they'll be bold with people they don't have to live with. <laughs> That's called calculated courage. And calculated courage is no courage at all. Asa would have nothing to do with that. You know, in this nation, when, when a king would die, there'd be a new king, his son, of course, but the queen would stay on. She would keep her almost first lady role and she would keep it the rest of her life or until the king married and the, the new wife was ready for it. But it was not a necessarily a one-to-one correlation. New king means new first lady. The, the role of queen mother was an official role with protocol functions and everything. Asa became king as a, a boy and so his mom stayed on in that role and he allowed her to until he realized about the idol worship that was going on. It was a prophet that brought this to his attention and once he realized it, he took it down. He didn't just remove his, his mother, he took the idol, he broke it into pieces, burned it and spread the ashes in the river. I mean, he dealt with the issue. He didn't allow compromise in his own house. He had the kind of boldness that would get control of his household first. 
This is also modeled for us in the New Testament, of course. Jesus says in Luke 14, 26, anyone who comes to me and doesn't hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life cannot be my disciple. I mean, you think, what does it mean to hate your father and your mother? Because doesn't the Bible also say you're supposed to love your parents or you're supposed to honor your parents? You're supposed to obey your parents. Does it not say those things? And the answer is yes, it does say those things. So how can you honor and obey whilst hating? (laughs) You know, in my household, we don't let our kids say the word hate, especially not in connection to food. Triple dog, especially not in connection to food. Their mom just made them. <laughs> You're going to love that food. Hate, come on. Yet Jesus says that you can't follow him unless you hate your own parents. Understand the New Testament, when it, love and hate are paired together, they're paired as a, a choice, a preference, where you cannot do both. There's a fork in the road. You're either going to go left or you're going to go right. And if you choose left, you love left. And if you choose right, you hate right. Coming from my house to church, there's two different ways to go. They both take the exact amount of time. My wife and I race all the time. It's always a tie. (laughs) If we choose left in the language of the New Testament, we hate right. Or if we go right, we hate left. The the image here, when Jesus uses these phrases, is that there comes a fork in the road and you cannot go both ways. There will be a time in your life where your parents will direct you one way, but the Lord will direct you the other way, and you need to have set in your heart right now at this very moment which way you're going to go. You cannot say you're following Christ if you don't have the conviction that when his commands conflict with the commands of your parents that you know what you're going to do. And this is not confined simply to non-believing households. This is true in Christian households as well. Even Christian parents may tell their kids, oh, don't don't do this or don't do that because of this reason or that. Don't go in the mission field because we want to keep you close by. Don't follow the Lord in this way because, you know, what would people think? Can't you just stay out of trouble? When sometimes the Lord calls you, in a sense, to get into trouble. Don't misquote me on that later. Teacher and I were doing premarital counseling with a, with a couple and the parents, this is not a Christian family, the parents of the bride felt very strongly that she should be living with her fiance before they got married. How else would you know it was going to work? So strongly that they would not support the wedding unless they'd moved in together. And what do you do? Is there a question? Do we, we're obviously not going to sin, we get that, but... Is there some way to honor our mom there? Should we break off the engagement? Should we get married apart from them? And it's those kind of scenarios that are are black and white often when you're dealing with non-Christians. And that's what Asa found himself in, this this woman who said, worship these idols. And Asa said, absolutely not. We will not offend the Lord. We'll go a different path from you. We separate from you at this point. We're going this way. You want us to go that way? We're going this way. This is not a, you know, I ask for potatoes and she gives me green beans kind of dispute. (laughs) This is a, my parents want us to sin and we won't sin. But as I said, you see that same dynamic sometimes, sometimes, sometimes in Christian families even where Christian parents want to keep kids safe or keep them from stepping out in faith for Christ. You know, Jesus modeled this, didn't he? He was preaching and his own mom came to him. People thought he was out of his mind and his own mom was trying to get him in off the street. I mean, don't you know, people think you're crazy. Just come in for the night, Jesus. And Jesus said, who is my mother? Remember the crowd said, your mom and your brothers and sisters are trying to to call you. And he said, who's my mother? Who's my brothers and sisters? Those who do the word of God, they're my mother. They're my brothers and sisters. He says, don't think I've come to bring peace on the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his old household. And when he's saying this, somebody shouts from the crowd. Somebody shouts to him, blessed are the breasts that nurse you. Blessed is the womb that bore you, they shout to Jesus. This is Luke eleven twenty-seven, 27. And Jesus says in eleven twenty-eight, 28, no, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. I hope you can declare that. Yes, you're supposed to love your parents. 
Yes, as, as children, you're supposed to obey your parents. And part of maturity is that that obedience changes into honoring. As you get older, it becomes less about obeying and more about honoring. As you become more mature, it becomes less about obeying and more about honoring. But listen, the best way to honor Christian parents is to let them know that you love the Lord more than them. That's truly honoring to a mother or father who fears the Lord. Next, Asa also means sacrificing for Yahweh. Sacrificing for Yahweh. Verse 15, he brought into the house of Yahweh the dedicated things that his fa- of, of his father and his own dedicated things, silver and gold and utensils. If you remember, his father had removed the, the dedicated things from the temple for his own wealth, from the temple to bribe opposing armies. That's what his father did and just decorated it with a facade. Asa moves the wealth back. Asa is doing this at his own expense. It's his own treasures. It's his own gold, his own silver. Have you ever met a king before that will divest his own riches or his own power for serving the Lord? This is Asa. He's letting his own wealth go so that that God's name will be greater. He's making actual sacrifices that hit his pride, that hit his wallet, that hit his ego. He is sacrificing those things for the service of Yahweh. Asa is not only Asa is not commanding other people to give their wealth. Did you notice that? Asa is taking control of what he has control of and using that for the Lord. He's not managing other people's hearts or other people's affections. He's controlling what he can control and using what he controls for the glory of the Lord, namely his own wealth here. This is an example of him belittling himself to exalt Christ. Remember Luke 14, 26 doesn't just talk about hating father and mother. It also says, if anyone comes after me, Jesus says, he must hate his own life. It's not like your hatred is all external. Oh, I prefer Jesus over your ways. Yeah, that's fine and well. What about Jesus over your way? When your path in life diverges from Christ's path, which one do you take? Jesus says, if you don't take the path of Christ, if you prefer the path of self over the path of Christ, then you are not fit to follow him one step. So trial basis discipleship here. You don't follow Jesus for six months and see if he really makes a demand on your life. You should know at the start, he'll really make a demand on your life. And herein is the irony of of the Christian life. If you want to be great, you seek to be small. If you want to make something of your life, you seek to make nothing of your life except service in Christ. If you want to be remembered, you seek to be forgotten and let Christ be remembered. If you want to make yourself a great name, you make yourself small. This is a John the Baptist lesson where people came to him and said, Jesus is baptizing more people than you are. And he says, he must grow greater, I must grow less. That's Asa's model. He's not building an empire for himself. He's building an empire for the Lord and he is content to do so. And like I said, it's the irony of the Christian life. At the end of his days, there's more about him as king than almost any of the other kings of Judah. He's the one that stands out because he sought to be low. If you want to be a leader among leaders, if you want to be a man among men, then you pursue greatness of Christ, not your own greatness. That's all examples of what Asa does mean. And by the way, as we went through this list, I hope you see that all of them are exemplified by Christ. All of them are exemplified by Christ. His, he said he could only do the will of his father. He said he didn't come to do his own will, but his will of the father. He exemplified what it means to love the Lord more than parents. He exemplified what it means to sacrifice even for, for the Lord as he gave his whole life to serving God. He even said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. This is the picture of Christ. In a sense, Christ was following Asa in those regards, but not in every regard, because there's one thing that Asa doesn't mean. Asa does not mean perfection. Asa does not mean perfect. Being a man after God's own heart does not mean being sinless. does not mean being sinless. And here's where Asa and Jesus split paths. (laughs) Because Christ never, ever sins. Yet Asa did. People get confused by lines in here about Asa. Asa didn't do everything right. He didn't get rid of the high places. It implies that he should have. He threw the prophet in jail. It was struck with a disease in his feet by God. So how can you say that Asa was a man after God's own heart? Because he was dealing with pride all the way to his grave. Listen, Asa was a man like David. (laughs) There's both a good and a bad side of that coin, isn't there? (laughs) 
Asa, here's a lesson in interpreting the Old Testament. It's a wrong approach to the Old Testament to try to put people in the good and bad categories. Good, bad, good, bad. People don't fit in those kind of, you don't do that in your world, do you? You don't view the person to your left or your right or in front of you or behind you or your neighbors as either good or bad. You're, that's not gonna be a fun person to be around if you view the world that way. Even Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, I've determined to no longer judge anyone according to the flesh. The only category you should have in your mind is are they following Christ or not? That's the boxes. Asa is clearly following the Lord. That's why the author of 1 Kings starts off by saying his heart was fully devoted to the Lord all the days of his life. So you know what box he fits in. But yes, there are people who are following the Lord all the days of their life who are sinful. Have you ever met a sinless person? The answer is no, no. <laughs> Never met a sinless person. Jesus alone is sinless. And so Asa has examples in his life of negative things. He didn't deal with the high places. When he was attacked in battle by the king of Israel, he didn't pray to God for help. Now, if you go to, don't flip to 2 Chronicles, but know the story in 2 Chronicles. When Asa was younger and he was attacked by the Libyans who had already conquered the Egyptians, the Libyans already owned Egypt, are now attacking tiny Judah, Asa had courage to stand up and pray to God. And God delivered him. When the Ethiopians attacked Asa, and this is a wonderful prayer to read, by the way, back in 2 Chronicles in your own time sometime this week. Read Asa's prayer when he was attacked by them. He said, God, you alone can give the victory. I stand in you, and God gave him the victory. But now he's attacked by the Israelites, and he does not pray. Why not? Maybe he felt bad about praying against other Israelites. They're both Jewish. I mean, why would he pray to Yahweh when the Israelites can also pray to Yahweh? Maybe that, maybe that was his thinking. Maybe he was just older now and was trusting himself more. I mean, he'd been king, uh, I think, 35 years by this point. Maybe he's more inclined to trust himself as an older man. That's possible. But whatever it was, he compromised. And listen, then his worst nightmare came true. His compromise worked. Whenever you compromise or you cheat or you sin in some kind of hidden way and you get away with it, that's the worst thing that can happen. Because then you don't repent. You know, to use a silly example, you cheat on your taxes and you get away with it, then you don't repent. You move on with life. And if somebody a year or two later were to come up to you and say, hey, you know, it's a sin to cheat on your taxes, you would probably say, back off. It's a... God's on my side on this. I got away with it. <laughs> what do you mean it's a sin? It's done with. You're definitely not going to repent. What kind of crazy talk is that? And so when the prophet comes to Asa and says, it was wrong of you to bribe the Syrians. You should have prayed to God. Asa's looking around and he's like, what do you mean it was wrong? We won the war. We won the war and not a single soldier died. I mean, that's tactical genius right there. And you're telling me that I did it wrong? So he throws the prophet in jail. But you know what? You can throw a prophet in jail all you want. You can't throw God in jail. And God strikes Asa's feet with a disease. Rather than pray, he paid. He used the gold. He dedicated the temple, took it back out. He bribed. He made a covenant with the pagan and he got away with it. And then he threw the prophet in jail. Well, he fell into sin like David. David, David was pursued by God and David repented. Asa was pursued by God and Asa didn't really repent, did he? He sized up his feet. He said, ah, I'm okay with swollen feet. And it got worse and worse and worse and he never repented. It says he didn't seek Yahweh, he sought physicians. Now there's nothing wrong with seeking physicians, of course not. But there is a big time thing wrong with seeking physicians instead of God. It's obviously a both ends kind of scenario there, not for Asa. So what's, what's fascinating to me here is that God extended Asa's life. He reigned for 41 years. That's longer than David. That's longer than Solomon. He, he's the longest king in Israel's history so far. Why? To try to bring him to repentance. You know, the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. <laughs> it was a battle of the wills here between Asa and the Lord. Who do you think wanted it more? <laughs> the Lord extended his life, extended his life, and then finally killed him for his sin. Had somebody in first hour say, hey, 
you can't say Asa was a believer because 1 John says that if you say you're walking in the light but you're walking in the darkness, you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. Listen, Asa was walking in the light. That is made clear by this. He was following the Lord with his whole heart. He was walking in the light. He didn't apostatize. He didn't go back and worship Baal or something at the end of this chapter. He worshiped the Lord his whole life. But he began to get more compromised in his old days. And the end of 1 John, by the way, 1 John 5 says there is a sin that leads to death. I'm not telling you to pray about that. That was Asa's sin, led him straight to death. What's the lesson for you from this? If you want to be like Asa, repent from your sin. Don't follow his footsteps all the way to his grave. Don't follow him in every regard. Follow him in the good ways, not the bad way. Follow him in the ways that the Lord modeled him. But leave Asa and follow Christ when Asa walks in sin. You know, Asa drew his courage from the prophets. Our Lord drew his courage from knowing the, award, the prize that awaited him at death, being reunited with his father, being given the church. We can now draw our courage from both. We draw our courage from the word of God and we draw our courage from knowing that Christ rose from the grave. That Jesus died after his sinless life to pay for our sin. He died after a sinless life to pay for the sins of Asa. And he lives at this moment making intercession for us. Don't follow Asa's prayerlessness. Don't close your lips to the Lord in prayerlessness because you think you can do it on your own. That's the bad part of Asa. Instead, understand that you have an advocate before the Father in heaven right now interceding on your behalf and that's the Lord Jesus Christ who was sinless. The bottom line, it is possible to lead a life like David. It is possible to be an Asa and shine like a bright light in our dark world. It's not possible to be sinless, but it's possible to strive. It's possible to be more and more conformed to the image of Christ. So ask yourself, are you willing to count the cost and go against this world? If our whole culture is going downstream, are you willing to stand in the stream and work your way upstream to oppose what sins you confront to take stands for Christ wherever he leads you and to turn the world upside down like King Asa did. We have enough chocolate-footed soldiers that melt under pressure. We have enough weak-kneed leaders that can't deal with sins in their own life or their family's life but are loud-mouthed when it comes to the world. We're short on people like Asa that will stand up, have their own house conform to God's commands and then take on the world as the Lord leads. Lord, we know that there's no games allowed when following you. There's no trial periods. <laughs> we also know that you, because you have conquered death, can conquer anything in our way. So we trust you to lead us, Lord. We want to, we want to cause good trouble for Christ. We want to be used by you in the world. We don't want to fit in we don't want to keep our heads down. We want to stand up straight and be bold and be used by you. I pray if there's one person in this congregation this morning that you would use this word in their heart that they would be determined to leave this place and stand against the world. Conform us to your image as we do this, Lord. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. You have been listening to Emmanuel with Pastor Jesse Johnson. You can find more resources like this at ibcva.com. Here is a parting word from Pastor Jesse. If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.